The rest of the examples are pretty clear. You begin to see that at the core of everything, this has direct relation to God's presence, and into the New Testament, God's presence, Emmanuel, God with us. God with us, the promise he'll never leave me nor forsake me. He's with me at all times. He's with me when things are good, and he's with me when things are bad. He's with me when I, I'm not even thinking about him. I hate to say it like that, but I speak the truth. He's with me when I'm sleeping or when I can't sleep. So when we begin to talk about that, the only thing that can disconnect you and the process and the action that God does in saying, this person is separate to me or this person is set apart is you pulling the plug of your faith activity and trusting God to complete the thing that he started. So we have been on the subject of the words and meanings of holiness and sanctification and um, I'm going to, today I'm going to start adding some new things, but I'm also going to repeat some things. So just kind of, as I said, bear with me. The Oxford Companion to Christian Thought suggests that holiness embraces a range of concepts to do with the otherness of God and the character of human life, which is ordered so as to be consciously centered on God and God's service. The Encyclopedia of Catholicism defines holiness, and I'm actually impressed by this definition to some degree, um, a spiritual quality derived from participation in the life of God who is the source of all holiness. Now, you're gonna, I'm going to do this to you. <laughs> I believe me, I, I was like, nah, I shouldn't do this to them. It won't be today, but I will present to you some different views through um, the eyes of several denominations and their definition within, um, let me see, except for one, they will all be within Protestantism and they all have a different view or understanding or definition, which is remarkable, by the way. Um, you wouldn't think that because we're all reading and translating from the same book, but that's, the challenge, and certainly when people come into the church, a lot of times people say, what's the big deal? Come on, you know? Do you have to be so uh, nitpicky about everything? The answer is yes. When it comes to God, yes. I mean, you know, I could say, what's the big deal? You know, why do you want to be so nitpicky about going to heaven? <laughs> what's the big deal? Just, you know, do whatever and whatever, right? Would you like that? Because I wouldn't. So um, just kind of putting that out there. Um, we have holiness as a state of being through the writings of Paul. Over 160 times you will read in Paul's writing in Christ. And you might say, well, how does this attach to the concept of holiness? Well, I've said before that we're going to see a transition from the Old Testament into the New. There has to be a change. Um, because a lot changed from the old to the new, but unfortunately, a lot of times what we have will be people taking an interpretation which may or may not be right from the Old Testament and bringing it into the new. And that, my friends, is what I've been trying to kind of deal with because I find that, and this subject is not preached on often, but when it is, when I have heard it dealt with or read articles, Interestingly enough, everything always comes back to one word which is difficult for me to wrap my mind around how, for example, in Eastern Christendom, in Eastern theology, in their understanding, you get a concept which is theosis. Theosis is essentially what we would call deification. And the idea behind that is if a person has been put in a category of holiness, it's, sorry, I don't believe this, but I'm telling you what, it's shades of things that can be absolutely um, believable or credible, but they're not biblical. And there's always going to be a grain of something that you can take and say, well, that's true. It's a kernel of truth somewhere in there. The fact that we teach 
the Bible teaches about the Spirit of God being placed in us, which I've said is the part payment, the Erebon is the Greek word, until we get the full redemption that is, I've always said it's like the coat check, you get your piece right now and at the end of your journey you'll get the whole ticket redeemed, right? But if you're going to have a relationship with God now and forever, I've said it's very important for us to learn what exactly God is saying to us. And the idea of holiness, and this is, again, I go back to saying the kernel of truth. I'm going to repeat this often, so just get used to it. The kernel of truth here, when people talk about perfection and holiness, it must, the term must, in some nuance somewhere, must connote somewhere that because God has said something is to be set apart, to be used by him and for his purpose, it must denote a certain degree of, hold your thought right here, don't cringe when I say this, of purity or of something that God, when he has said, it's mine, because he said, this thing is mine, he brings along the power to enable the thing to be cleansed. In the Old Testament, it is with water, with oil, and with blood. And in the New Testament, we'll encounter the cleansing, as Jesus says, through his word and ultimately through his blood. And then if you want to take it all the way to take all the types along, you'll get the, the oil with the Holy Spirit, the water with the word. So there's always going to be something where we have to get the, the, the terminologies correct, the understanding of the word correct, and as I said, it's impossible to be able to define in one meaning, in one word. Why? Because first, we're dealing with Hebrew. And here's something that will kind of, you'll go, oh, why didn't you tell me this before? From going back and pulling all the resources that I could, what I found is that this word that we're looking at in the Hebrew, which is kadosh, kadesh, kadosh, isn't even a Hebrew word. Okay, so, it, but it does come from a, a Semitic stream. It, it's, it actually comes to us from something called the Proto-Semitic, which if you trace it down, you'll actually find traces of it in the uh, Proto-Canaanite. And so if, I don't expect you to learn that. That's not something, but I'm just saying, when you start digging, you find, wow, this isn't even actually part of the language that I'm dealing with. But it gets grafted in, just like the words that we graft into English that become part of our, our way, our language, our vocabulary. So um, there is a, a great article, a paper that was written by a man named Hugh Barber. And he basically, what he did was he simpli simplified. I'm giving you this as just an introduction, really not part of my message today, but just to tell you what's coming down the road. He identified six uh, models, if you will, within Christendom of, and, and that six models that basically is six denominations and their understanding for the Anabaptist holiness or sanctification essentially is to be summed up in one word, perfect obedience. For the Calvinist perfectly surrendered, the perfectly surrendered will for the um, Franciscans or the monks, perfect humility. For the mystics, perfect inner peace. For the Methodists, perfect love. And for the Quakers, perfect openness to guidance. They should have listened to somebody when they said, you got to have kids. <laughs> All right, they were perfectly open to that, I'm sure. Uh, OK, leave it to me to find some weird humor somewhere. OK, let's go to. And I, I didn't want to drag out all of my dictionaries, so I've actually just made notes from certain dictionaries or sources, and I'm going to tell you what they are in case you want to take notes and look them up for yourself. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, which actually has a whole section. When you go through the theologic, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, it usually takes you through a word grouping first in antiquity, then it'll take you through Hebrew, then it'll take you through the Septuagint, then it'll take you through the Greek. If you're reading that um, article, 
which happens to be um, the editor is Jared Kittle, um, copyright 60, 1964 and 1995 from Erdman's. On page 89, this is the source of what I just said. The use of the term holiness in the Old Testament probably does not originate with Hebrew, but rather with Canaanite. And I have another source that suggests any proto-Semitic uh, language, I followed and traced this word that we're looking at uh, in the Hebrew through Akkadian, through Punic. I've traced it through Arabic, through Ethiopic. And you'd be surprised that they all, they may allude to a general meaning of something, but then they all carry nuances of something else. Um, the Dictionary of the Targumum, which is Marcus Jastro, Judaica Press, Volume 1, New York, 1989, page 1319. Um, one of the scholars, there's an entry in there that instead of having the word have what is called the triconsonantal, which is three consonants to form the word, a lot of times in Hebrew you'll have, you may have, it is permitted to have two consonants. So one of these scholars, and let's get rid of that because you might think that those are patas, vowels, and they're not. They were just showing you. But a scholar um, by the name of Fleischer proposed that we should go to the root instead of, let me write this for people who don't know what exactly I've written. For the root of Kadesh, we should just look at k, kof, and dalid as a word. He defines this word to be understood as what is marked off or to divide or in direct opposition as an antonym of um, if this word is to separate, to cut off, to divide, to mark off from the secular in contradistinction to what is profane and common. So we're always going to come back to this. Um, all right. From the proto-Semitic um, root, which implies a state or character of holiness. State can be a state of being, can be a character. But remember, it is not, we do not have intrinsically, inherently, anything of this holiness or sanctification. And I'm going to start to define the terms a little bit better because I've been tossing them around generically. That, I'm sure, adds to the confusion. So when we talk about um, that character or state of holiness, it is not that which we will act out. In fact, if you begin to, as I think I said to you, if you'd like to do this, if you have nothing better to do with your time, uh, you know, because... We all have so much extra time in life. Um, you could basically take all of the references in, I don't think I brought mine out here, I didn't, in the, in the lexicon and go through and you'll find that each time um, the first reference to the word, the Hebrew word, Kadesh, is going to be in Genesis where it says that God sanctified that seventh day as a day of rest, you'll find again the word as we're studying it appears in other parts in Genesis as we encountered uh, Judah's wonderful experience with Tamar and she is considered holy, right? And if you don't know that, I just read it. I don't want to <laughs> take the time to do that now. Just read it for yourself, okay? Um, <laughs> that's what you heard in church. Um, all right, so if you keep going, though, that the understanding of the, the way the word is being used as you get into Exodus and Leviticus will begin to make something clear. Now, let's take some real examples from the Bible and see if we can start to piece together what I have been saying this word cannot mean. Now, take Exodus, the third chapter, and... Moses, who's been on the backside of the desert all these years, he sees the spectacle. He has to turn and look. He sees a burning bush that was on fire but not consumed. And God speaks to him. And God says to him, 
Moses, not hey you, but he says Moses. He speaks his name and he says, Moses, take off your shoes. The place where you're standing is hallowed ground. That's the first time that we encounter that. Now, the reason why the ground is hallowed is the same reason that Mount Sinai is hollow. That's the same principle. God's presence is there. It's God's presence. Now, remarkably, and forgive me for being a little bit choppy here and explaining some things, remarkably, in one of the multiple views on understanding sanctification and holiness, there is one group that actually takes the concept and I, I want to say develops it almost to a place where I could say, yeah, that makes sense. And they go and ruin it, of course, with telling you how you have to act a certain way afterwards. But what we can take away from this, the ground, let's talk about that for a minute. When, when God says, take off your shoes, the place where you're standing is hallowed ground. Now, bear with me. Can the ground be perfect? It's kind of a silly question to ask. I don't, I don't even know how you determine the perfection of the ground. Where, what did we come out of? The ground. You know, I mean, if you're going to study this book, take it collectively, take all the pieces, and you begin to realize when somebody says, this word has one final meaning to it, it can't be. The difference between God saying, and his presence is there, actively there, saying, take your shoes off, Approach me, but take your shoes off. The ground you're standing on is hallowed. It's hallowed because God is there. And you, you take the same frame of reference when you have Moses in the mountain. He says, basically, tell the people to not come near the first time. Then he says, now sanctify the people, and then they can come near. Strange thing, it's the mount I'm referring to, by the way, Mount Sinai. Anyone that comes near that is not essentially authorized, the common people come near and they touch, God says, they're going to die, right? So I'm not so sure that we can take the concept of the Sabbath day or the ground and say, well, this has to mean perfection in this way, because it can't. It can't. And paradoxically, there are places in the Bible where it will be absolutely 100% clear, specifically when God is speaking of himself, when he says, I am holy, when he's speaking of himself, where we must absolutely unequivocally say, yes, it's an attribute of God, it is a dimension of God's person, and therefore it is, because he is, perfect. So you can't just homogenize and put these words. And don't say to me, oh, you know, you're engaging in semantics. And no, I'm not. I'm engaging in a careful study because I would like to know at the end of my study, at the end of this series, that I have taken away the idea which has kept a lot of us, including yours truly, although I luckily a few years back just kind of gave a happy seven fingers to the people who just can't figure it out for themselves. No one in this lifetime is ever going to be perfect. And the idea that most will carry with perfection, holiness, and sanctification is sinlessness. Now, I've said this before. Inanimate objects, they can be sinless. They can have no sin in them because they don't have free will and they don't have the capacity. You know, a lamp. <laughs> oh, look, the lamp. It's sinned, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> at least that's the way my mi hermanos that's the way they're going to say it, right? The, the lamp, it broke itself. But, and then the lamp won't be holy, it will be in pieces. But, uh, <laughs> never mind. Okay, let's uh, save the humor for later. So, we have, let's talk about back to the degrees of holiness then, because it's not a one size fits all. If you're taking um, items that you read them between Exodus and Leviticus, they range from most holy. Uh, uh, the way I'm going to read them will be the, the, the holiest of all down to the lesser, but still holy. 
for example, the ark is at the top of the list. It's at the top, top of the list. Then the altar of incense, then the lampstand, then the table of showbread, then the outer altar, or we'll call it the altar of burnt offering, and the basin. Six things that go from highest to lowest. And this is why you can't just lump everything and say, see, this just, it's, it's one lump thing. It's not. The Sabbath was holy. Restrictions connected with that day serve to maintain its distinctiveness and its distinctive nature as to guard it from becoming a day like any other day. Now, let me ask you this question. God sanctified the Sabbath. He said he set it apart. You're going to hear me say this not once, but probably two or three times today. My problem with that is, yes, that's true. The day was set apart. But in terms of understanding what it means, the definition of that almost leaves me flat. Well, I, it's a no-brainer. It's axiomatic. The Sabbath was set apart. What does that mean for you and for me? How should we understand this? Well, plainly said, God said, this is the day that I'm declaring. And it could have been any day. I'm declaring this day separate and distinct from the other days, the days that I labor, the days that I created, the days that you work, and the days that you must work versus this day, which I say is set apart. But why? Why this particular day? And I'm not going to answer that question now. Just thought I'd tell you that. <laughs> this is what I do so good. But um, I, I ask questions, and I don't answer them. But um, what we can know is that even the Sabbath, the design of the Sabbath was to keep the focus on God. And the idea, of course, is that day that God set apart where the people were not working also provided the opportunity, if you will, on God's part. God didn't, doesn't need an opportunity, but provided that for a day of, sometimes you'll read, holy convocation, a gathering, a ceremony of sorts, but all to worship God. So this, this idea somehow that the subject can be treated apart from God and his presence can't be. Now, you can say something is holy. It's this pen is holy. It is only used for this tablet. That's all it can be used for. It's not a pen with ink in it. It's a pen that's designed that when I touch the screen right there, I'm doing all this nice squiggly stuff. That's what it's designed for. But I could take this pen and I could bring it over here, and I can try and do something. Nothing's happening. This pen really is just for that over there. That's like the inanimate objects that God says are mine. They have no other purpose. But we, we're human. We've got other things going on, right? That's what I said. All right, so now let's talk about these other things. And I think today we'll be, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get the tough uh, language stuff out of the way. And then maybe we can actually have some real lessons happen here, which wouldn't be bad. Um, before I get into my scriptural references, I want to read something to you. The problem is it's in French. So, and I know we have a couple of people who do understand French. But anyway, if you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm going to translate it in a minute after I'm done reading. But this is from somebody who I have long, um, all of his writing, been very gripped by. This is Emile Beneviste, Beneviste. Um, This is Le Sens Commun, Le Vocabulaire des Institutions Indo-Européennes. And underneath it, the subheading is Pouvoir, Droit et Religion. Uh, will, what is right, and religion. There is a section in this book if you can find this book, and if you read French, otherwise don't bother. Because you'll just be, I don't know, saying things with a French accent. <laughs> there is a whole section here, and he does this brilliantly. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, because it would take up a lot of time, and the translation for me is, is easy. But um, it, he, this is what... What he says, I'm going to read the French and then I'll translate for you. Um, let's see where I can start is a good place here. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago, I showed you if we were tracing the Proto-Indo-European root for the words 
sacred sanctification, it took us to a root that looks like that. Do you remember that? Okay. Now, I just actually remembered that he had done several different word studies. So I didn't, I didn't read this until a couple of days ago, and I didn't have this part of the information that I'm going to give you last week. So I find it interesting that he's saying, I'm saying the same thing that he's saying, because I don't want to say that he's saying the same thing that I am, because he's dead. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Sacros, or sac, est un dérivé en ro. This is, I have to write this down. Um, sacred versus, and let's put that here. And the words that are sanct versus that. We know that these words, from where we get our word sacred, come from there. But the problem, which I was saying last week, is there must be another word group because these do not come from the same place. So I was so happy to read that he has the same conclusion. He says here, Sacros est un dérivé en ro d'une racine sac, the root of sac, or sanctus, et proprement le participe de sancio, lequel est dérivé de la même racine. It's derived from the same root, however he says. Mais cette relation morphologique ne rend pas compte du sens qui est différent. He's essentially saying, il ne suffit pas de retacher ensemble sensio et sanctus à la racine. Sac, puisque sancère, produit de son côté le verbe sacraire. He's saying that these two verbs cannot be from the same root. And this is a man who spent his whole life um, writing and studying on Indo-European and Semitic roots. And he's saying the same thing, which means somewhere in our, in our language stream, things dropped off and fell away. It's always, this is my lot in life. You know, when I was, I was teaching something and I told you about a letter in the English that dropped off, the Thor, do you remember that? Yeah. And then a whole bunch of you went and said, wow, I didn't even know that there were letters that were here that disappeared. There'll be a whole bunch of people, I'm sure, looking, going to try and find where this grouping comes from. I'm almost of the mind, this article is some 25 pages long. I'm almost of the mind because it was not, this particular article was not translated into English. I'm of a mind to translate it myself for you um, and will either read it or in part make some commentary on it because what he does is he picks apart, going back to the, he's dealing with the New Testament studies, but he goes back into antiquity and he says, these roots must be different, and that will help us understand why there's such a collision. If you, if you were to look up, somewhere here we have the ability to just read it straight from the source. And that's what I want to do. Sometimes I'll just I'll paraphrase things. I want to read this straight from the source for you. All right. I read this to you before, but let me read it again because you're going to see even in this article regarding the definition of sacred. The Latin adjective, and this, by the way, is, this is from um, Word Origins. And if you'll tune in on Festival, I will give you the title and the publisher, which I normally would do if I bring the books out here. The Latin adjective, sacer, and that's the word we're dealing with, meant dedicate or consecrate to a divinity holy, as in locus sacer, holy place. It was also used to mean accursed, as in Virgil's ori sacra famis, accursed hunger for gold. It was the holy sense, however, that gave rise to the verb sacrer, to dedicate or consecrate to a divinity, to set apart as sacred. Now, when I was reading this article, you don't want to be in this brain sometimes, because I'm reading this article and I'm thinking, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I had just finished studying the word groups from here. And I thought to myself, they have just this article, which is 
an etymological study. They have just homogenized two roots. I wouldn't have known that definitively had I not, and this is a gold standard for me, so I, I, I'll put myself out there and say, interesting that this uh, article commingled two roots, two stems, without even acknowledging that they're separate and distinct. Why am I making this big of a deal, you say? What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, what if I told you that in the sense of what God declares, what he says is, when he says, this is set apart, this is holy, I'm going to use this, this is mine, it belongs to me. That's God speaking. Versus when God says, I'm going to use this for a purpose, but it's limited. It's not continuous. And the, the thing that I'm going to use on a limited basis, not continuous, and as I will, God speaking, which would be, if we're taking the roots as they appear, could be separate, divided, distinct, but not perfect. Have I killed this yet? No, because you didn't answer that tells me We'll just keep going until you go, I got it. Because that's the whole point. The difference to be able to determine when, you're, when you start reading the passages that I have referenced out of Genesis, out of Exodus 3, 5, and if you take all of the examples, every single example, and I, off the top of my head, want to say that there has to be uh, in the whole Old Testament, there is, a, I think it's a couple of hundred uh, occurrences of our word, but not being translated all the same way. And I pointed this out last week. Let me give you an idea. Here is one I wrote out this week, and I may make these available in better form so you can actually read it. It's hard to, for me to read my own writing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. But if you were to be taking what Exodus 29, 21 says, and you can turn there if you want in the King James. I'm going to read it. And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon the garments of his sons with him. He shall be hallowed and his garments and his son's garments with him. Now, I underlined the word hallowed, and then I went to look up in the NIV, the New International Version uses, and he shall be holy. King James, I just read it, hallowed. The Holman Christian Bible, holy. The Jubilee Bible says sanctified. So it's kind of interesting. The one thing we can know, for example, in this example is that they're using the same Hebrew word as a verb. That we can know. But no one is going to use the same word to translate. Different, different versions, different English versions are using different words. And I think this just breeds more of the problem. Take a look at this example from Exodus as well. Exodus 30 and verse 29. Thou shalt sanctify them, that they may be most holy. Whatsoever touches them shall be holy. Ask yourself, I just read something that's kind of mind-boggling. What, what am I just reading? What, what, whoever touches what will be holy? Okay. So let's, let, me, let me find the, this is for the, this is 29, I'm sorry, 30 and verse 29. All right. And I'm just looking to make sure that I actually wrote <laughs> on my paper <laughs> Exodus 30 and 29. All right. If you notice, in that verse, you've got, thou shalt sanctify, that they may be most holy, and whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. Go back a little bit, and you start to read, and here is a pattern. Thou shalt make, thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, verse 25, an ointment compound. After the art of the apothecary, it shall be and holy anointing oil. Well, that's clear to me. 
that holy anointing oil is going to be used for a specific purpose. It's not going to be used to uh, cook up the evening's uh, manna noodles, right? <laughs> it's going to be used for a specific purpose. So there, that carries with us that very generic meaning, something that's just set apart for the use of the deity. I can be satisfied there. But keep reading. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all his vessels, and the candlestick, and his vessels, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering, with all his vessels, and the laver, and his foot. And thou shalt sanctify them, that they may be most holy. So we went from holy to most holy. Whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. Notice what it says there. Whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. Now usually it says in other places how people, if you read, how when God says make something, put something aside, usually there's a pattern of sprinkling or anointing. It's oil, it's blood, it's water. Tell them to go wash themselves, then sprinkle them with blood. I know that's out of order. It doesn't matter. That's the way God said it. So what we have clearly is in the sense of when it says, and thou shalt sanctify them that they, that they may be most holy, whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. The idea of just coming in contact with that which God has said is, in this case, makes everything else that comes in contact with it holy. Now, you don't think that somewhere back there, somebody, the children of Israel did this long before the Catholics did. Trust me, the Catholics with their hocus pocus and, you know, don't give the, the wafer, the host, to the people because in case a crumb falls on the floor and a rat eats it and then the rat becomes holy, right? And then you've got a holy rat problem. And you can't exterminate them because they're holy, right? But you can get a holy cat. <laughs> holy set apart? Never mind. All right. Thou shalt sanctify them that they may be most holy. Whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. That, that, that sounds something for me that says this is a different type versus that which is anointed versus that which you come in contact with it. Very much the same way, the way you would come in contact with a dead person as a ch ch the children of Israel were told, don't come in contact with a dead person, you will be defiled because you've co come in contact with a dead person. It's the same concept here as in coming in contact with something that has been holy and touching it just by virtue of the association makes that thing that touched it or that person holy. Cow. All right. <laughs> and thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Consecrate them, not so that they can go out and show everybody else that they're so holy and that they're so set apart, but for God. Again, once more, God's presence, worship unto the Lord. It's, this is going to, you're going to start to see something now is going to come about each time because God is not saying make something holy and sanctify it and set it apart so it can just sit there. It's going to be God speaking, used for me, for my purpose. Now let me ask you the $10 million question because it's looming there somewhere. The Bible says, all souls are mine. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and all the people, the fullness thereof and all the people therein. Now when God said, you gotta just, it's crazy, but when God says, this is mine, it's his. We don't have to say, oh God, prove it. Now, unless you're someone who just doesn't believe and you say God doesn't exist, and you can say, that's stupid. I don't even want proof because it doesn't exist because it can exist. But for the people who read this book when God says all souls are mine and he declares that you are not your own, you're bought with a price, I'm now coming into the realm of understanding that sanctification is not the act or process of justification. It is not the act or process of prevenient grace that's finding me beforehand, but it is the activity of God's presence working in my life to change me into his image and likeness, which will be a lifetime work. And there I begin to see what exactly the concept of being set apart for the exclusive use just makes it sound like I could be a hand towel and God says, my hands are wet. 
right? That's not the type of setting apart we're talking about. So it, it becomes a concept that will become clearer and clearer. And probably the best example of using a, an antonym to drive home the point, you're going to find something, we're going to go completely out of our box today, ooh, big deal, and go to 1 Samuel. <laughs> Ooh, we're traveling outside of Exodus and Leviticus. This is risky, guys. Okay. Samuel 21. And I'm actually just going to read it from the beginning so you're not, some of you who are not familiar with this passage won't go, eh? 1 Samuel 21. Then David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? Remember, David's on the run. David said to, unto Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, liar, and hath sent unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now, David just told a lie. And the reason why I'm pointing this out once more is because people seem to think that this idea of being set apart for God's use, was David set apart for God's use? Yes. Was he perfect? Yes. Did he make mistakes? Yes. That's my point. So maybe today, after four or five weeks of going on this, <laughs> I speak your language. You're going to be saying, yes, it cannot mean that. Whatever else it does mean, it cannot mean that. David was not perfect. He made mistakes. He was a sinful man, even though it says he was. He was a man after God's own heart. If you catalog at least three or four of the major wrong choices he made, which had extreme consequences for both he, the people around him, the, the people of God, you'd say, well, that doesn't sound like perfect. That doesn't even sound like holy, because our idea of holy is someone who's in you know, perfect piety and, you know, we're all goody-goody and everything. But no, he's asking him, he's going to ask him for bread. Now, therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or whatever is there is present. And the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread under my hand. That word for common Chol. And this is why I said to you, it's important for us to make this distinction between holy and common, not holy and unholy as in perfect and not perfect, or as in sinful and sin sinlessness. No. Set apart versus what's common. Now you're going to start to see when God sets people apart, like he did, go into the New Testament now, and you see the Apostle Paul no, it never says precisely in these words, but he, he, articu he articulates it in saying that essentially he was, he was a chosen vessel. And when you begin to see, God set apart Paul for a purpose. And it wasn't, by the way, some random thing. It was a specific task. And it was, was he preaching the gospel? Yes, but to a particular people with his background and his education, which essentially rescued Christianity from just becoming a splinter of Judaism. So when you have something to compare it to, something that is going to be used by God, Paul, versus someone who wasn't used by God, now you're outside of the realm of perfect, you're outside of the realm of sinlessness or sinfulness. Now, will the concept of sin and sinfulness play a part in our word in some Areas, absolutely. There will be areas where it's very clear that there is a ritual cleansing going on. We'll call it the cultic practices of the day. And therefore, the, ne the necessity or the requirement to wash, to purify, to cleanse oneself, again, different from common. So he says, whatever is under your hand. The priest answered David and said, there is no common bread under my hand, but there is hallowed bread, holy bread, Kaddish bread. That's there. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women. Remember, there was this 
ceremonial requirement for those individuals, whether they were going to war or if they were on a certain mission or particular, that being with women would defile them as well. David answered the priest and said unto him, of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy. I don't know you want to go there. Don't even touch that. <laughs> and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put out hot bread in the day when it was taken away. So essentially, even though the bread is it's holy bread, right? It's a table of showbread. And that bread is the bread that was baked from the manna that the people gathered. So basically, it's an offering from the people to God. But on this particular day, David's got just the right timing because the English here is a little bit funky, but you read in the Hebrew and it makes it very clear that he came just at the right time because that, that bread that was just freshly baked, that hot, good bread. <laughs> now, it's 12.30. Some of the bellies are going, <laughs> Enjoy that hot bread smell for just a minute, right? And David says, well, this bread essentially is going to be replaced. That's the deal right there. Even though, and, and even though it's going to be replaced with today's hot bread, and it's not stale, by the way, because it's holy bread. <laughs> but this is the deal. So it's kind of neat, this little exchange. The priest gave him the hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. And this gives you the exact, we'll call it the, the core of what I've been saying, which is this, this special bread unto the Lord. But the priest says, he said, when he's referring to it, he doesn't say a bread that is, the description is, hallowed bread that was designed for God for a purpose, by the way, in worship. But then he also uses the term common when he says, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So this is where we start to get more and more clarity on this word. Remember, I said to you common or profane, and our word for profane, which comes from, actually, there's a whole stream of words which are kind of interesting, fanatic, but profane from pro, outside, or before, and fanus, the temple. So things that are outside of the temple, that would be just considered for common use, common consumption, common everything. Now, if the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and everything that's in there, and we might say even that the things that God has not designated as holy, but if he made them, and he says he's made some vessels to destruction, others for honor to, versus some to honor and some to dishonor. If he made all of this, and you can, if you want to be a product of evolution, knock yourself out, but he, if he made all this, we'll say that maybe some of you are asleep now because nobody <laughs> responded to the fact that I said you might be a product of evolution. But that's okay. Um, but if you want to believe that, but if you believe that God created everything, then he didn't create an accident. And his acts or his intent was specific. Therefore, when he deems something, when he calls something holy that is going to be for his use or to worship him, it's not random. Now, I think, hopefully, I have dealt with this enough. I am going to save my... Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament to torture you on festival later today. Um, because I know you like it when I read lexicons and dictionaries to you. It just, it excites you so much. So I will do that. Uh, and some of you who just want to take a nap, turn the TV on while I'm reading out of the dictionary. Works really good. All right. But what I do want you to leave here today with, because I think I've done enough of the foundation and of the nuts and bolts, I would really like us to get into treating each book, and I, I do want to treat each book differently, separately, and we're going to have to do this like looking at Exodus, looking at Leviticus, looking at each uh, where we have the highest concentration of these examples, and you will see that as now I think I've, I've laid enough foundation to say what this is not, that we can go now and look at each of the groups from each book when we can actually line them up and say, for example, in Exodus there may be 
I'm using a random number, don't quote me on this, there may be 150 occurrences of the word holy, but how they occur, and specifically what I told you last week about the verb, the, the way verbs are conjugated in the Hebrew gives you the insight that it's not a one word definition and we'll have clarity by just saying it just means this. But as you go through the verbs and now you've, you've got the meaning, which is not perfect, I'm not even going to say, and as I think it's four or five occurrences where we might attach sinlessness or sinfulness to the equation, but everything else will have its own clarity based on the verbal forms used, or if it's an adjective that is describing something. The adjective's a piece of cake, by the way, because an adjective's an adjective. The sky is blue, a strong person, right? So when we say something is holy, all we have to understand is in the context of what is being said. Number one, what is it that made that individual holy? We start with God, who's the source of all holiness, but what exactly was it? Was there a ritual involved? For example, in Exodus and Leviticus, there's a lot of sprinkling of blood and a lot of anointing with oil. And now we start to see that there were steps taken when God said, get up there and sanctify these people, or you're going to, whatever his instructions are, he'll also give a way to. Now, there are probably a half a dozen examples, and they're different. There's not, it's not always the blood, it's not always the oil, it's not always water. But when God gives the instructions, he will say, this is how an object, with the exception of, I think, half a dozen examples, which are not specified on how the thing or the individual became holy because it doesn't give the, the prescription of how, how to carry out making this person be in that state. But the rest of the examples are pretty clear. You begin to see that at the core of everything, this has direct relation to God's presence, and into the New Testament, God's presence, Emmanuel, God with us. God with us, the promise he'll never leave me nor forsake me. He's with me at all times. He's with me when things are good, and he's with me when things are bad. He's with me when I, I'm not even thinking about him. I hate to say it like that, but I speak the truth. He's with me when I'm sleeping or when I can't sleep. So when we begin to talk about that, the only thing that can disconnect you and the process and the action that God does in saying this person is separate to me or this person is set apart is you pulling the plug of your faith activity and trusting God to complete the thing that he started. And if there's one area that I don't think any two people agree on, but I'm going to put myself out there and say it, the something that is being conformed to which is an ongoing work that God is doing. That process of conforming you and me to the image and likeness, which is what is said in Ephesians, changing us into the image and likeness of his dear son can only come by one way, and is not because I will act or I will imitate. And yes, there are places in the Bible, where, especially from Paul's writing, where it says, be ye imitators, mimitai is the Greek word, mimic me. I would say to you, the best advice I can give you, that may be the worst thing that Paul ever said, but for people who don't know what I'm trying to explain and you still haven't gotten the core of it, if you were even going to take Paul's be imitators of me, take a look at Paul's life, dedicated to the Lord, dedicated to serve, in worship, in preaching, in expanding the kingdom of God, but not for another purpose. When we get that clear, and this is where there's a whole body of people that go off the deep end because their idea of that, which I've just described, is living in a cloister, living tucked away outside of the realm of society, including, by the way, as I mentioned a week or two ago, those people who, who hold the absolute belief that because Paul said it's better for you to not touch a woman, be as I am, but sorry, Paul was married. And when people say, well, celibacy, you know, the, the requirements to keep yourself pure. Uh, wait a minute. God never said there was anything immoral, wrong, or anything else between a man and a woman's relations in terms of what I'm describing. We're not talking about random relations. We're talking about husbands and wives. And when Paul says, be as I am, I think the, the mindset is he had one business at hand, and it wasn't looking after his wife and making sure that she's a happy wife with a happy life. 
It was serving the Lord and making sure that the word of God was put out there in plain speech for every single individual that would listen, including those that said, what is this babbler saying? To those that said, this must be the truth. Of a truth, this must be the truth. So it's important for me that I think, I think we have the, the core of a good foundation to start building and, and doing this, as I said, book by book. And I would really like to ask you if you will tune in, figure out when I'm going to be live. Oh boy. Tune in, and I will walk you through why the verbs, without doing all of the intense conjugation, why the verbs will help you. And I'm, I think I want to do this. I, one of the staff people started uh, a handout for me, and I kind of said, you know what, I want to add to it, and I want to modify it a little bit. But I think if you had a handout, with something that you could look at and study with, it'll be very helpful, especially if you want to start doing your own word study on this subject. It will help you tremendously. So I think that's what we'll do. But right now, I think all the heavy stuff, all the heavy duty, confusing stuff might be out of the way. The only thing we're going to have to do is, um, gosh, we're just going to have to read through a bunch of dictionaries and sort it out, <laughs> right? Piece of cake. Uh, funny thing was that somebody commented and said they had been watching, and they said, you know, it's like a, it's a, it's a classroom. It is a classroom. I wouldn't want to be in a place where, you know, you go to church on Sunday morning, and it may be great that you can have uh, uh, a 10 or a 20-minute sermon or homily, but I want to learn. I want to become, I want to be better in my understanding about the person I say I want to spend the rest of my life and eternity with. So it's important for me that this be a learning place, not a place of entertainment. If you want entertainment, then um, tune into Newman's channel. <laughs> Doesn't have one, so don't look, all right? But uh, what I would like to tell you, though, is that if you'll stick with me, I think this will pay off big time for us. I think it already has for some of us as the, I can see some of you, the lights are coming on like, well, that's not what I understood that as. Well, here we go. So please, as I said, watch the, re, the repeat, the rerun, and let's try and pick up next week, starting with some real handles to hold on to, to get the understanding out of the way and the messages that we need to put out there regarding the subject of how this is going to apply to you. After all, I come back to ask you the same question. Should you and should I be concerned with what the Bible says in our understanding? Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. If you understand that, then I think if we can understand that together, we've made good progress. And that is going to be my goal. We get to the place where we say, we know what that means. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to press close and press towards the mark because I want to be in his presence and I want to stand in his presence and I want to hear him say, enter in, well done, good and faithful servant. He'll say it to all those who trusted him, whether it's a little or a lot, for simple faith. So I hope you'll be here next week and I will continue on and hopefully you leave here today going, I know what it's not. I may not have any other clue, but I know what it's not. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.